All right, I'm here to talk about um, what I call big data serving uh, and a platform that I'm an architect of, Vespo, that uh, um, solves this problem um, in open source. So first I'll be talking about what I mean by big data serving, what's the use cases, what's the problems, things like that. And then I'll be talking about uh, Vespa, which is the open source engine we have created to solve these kind of problems. And then, as time permits, I'll go deeper into architecture and capabilities and using Vespa and so on. This is a lot of slides, so I'll either be talking really fast or skipping some parts. Um, I'd like to start by, introduce, by talking about the, the big data maturity level. When organizations start out, uh, they usually create a lot of data in logs and so on, but they don't actually use it for anything systematically. And that's what I call the latent phase. At some point, they understand that it's useful to look at this data systematically to use it as for decision making. So that's the analysis stage. But there's still users, uh, actual employees looking at the data, creating reports, uh, and so on. Right? Then you get to the learning stage where you try to automatically learn insights from your data, right? which is what people are doing with machine learning, obviously. Then at last you get to the acting phase where you try to make decisions in real time uh, based on your data. And there's two subcategories of that. One is what's called either stream processing or model serving, depending on whether you do re request response or streams. And that is where it's sufficient to look at a single data item to make a decision. The other problem is where you need to look at many data items to make a single uh, decision. And that's what I mean by big data serving. Right? So if we do a simple example down here, which is something like Netflix, a movie streaming site, uh, at first maybe you just serve the movies and you log which users are looking at which movie. Then at some point you go to the analysis stage and you start to do analytics to discover what kind of users are looking at what movies so that you can create curated lists of movies to recommend. Right? At some point you want to uh, stop paying people to do that job and you start using machine learning to create those lists uh, for you. But you still do it offline, right? You uh, either on Hadoop or something like that, you look through all your data and you generate all these list of recommendations for different kinds of users and then you move them to your serving system and you serve them. And then the last stage of the acting phase, you defer the decision about what to recommend to every single user to the point where the user needs the recommendations. And there are many good reasons to do that, right? Uh, if you defer the decision making until the users actually need the decision to be made, you can use all the up-to-date information you have, both about the user, about the data. All the information you have can go into that decision making. It's not out of date, right? Secondly, you don't uh, waste computation because you never eagerly compute something that you're not actually going to need because you do it only in response to something happening, right? Uh, for that same reason, your decision making can be much more fine grained. In the movie example, right, you can move from recommending different lists of videos to adults, uh, uh, tech interested people, or whatever, to creating a separate list for every single user, right? Something that would be too expensive in most cases if you do it eagerly upfront. And from an architectural point of view, if you can uh, treat the system that uh, do the real-time decision-making as a black box, the, your architecture becomes much simpler. Because usually to work around those problems I just mentioned, you end up with a quite complicated system where you have some batch processes that learn something and some other processes that moves that data to your serving system, but then it's out of date, so you create additional systems on top that amends the uh, out-of-date decisions you made with real-time information that you put on top and things like that. Right? 
So all that goes away if you just commit to doing everything real time, right? But why aren't everybody doing this? It's because it's really hard, right? And why is it hard? It's because you combine a bunch of things that are hard to do and scale into one single thing. So you sort of get uh, multiplication of the difficulties. So you have, you're dealing with state, obviously, because uh, you, ha you need to store the state that you do uh, decision making over. And because you are finding out, because you need to compute over low latency budget, over loss of data, you need to fan out to multiple nodes working in parallel. So you had a problem of doing scatter gather with a, a low latency budget. And you need, since you're online serving directly to users, you need this whole thing to have high availability, right? So the features you need, you need to be able to find data and make inferences in typically a few tens of milliseconds. Uh, you need at the same time to be able to handle uh, real-time updates at a high continuous rate. You need to be able to handle large request rates over the data because you're dealing directly with end users and there's a lot more end users than, for example, employees, right? So you need to be able to handle uh, high request rates. And as I mentioned, you need to be always available because your end users out in the world typically won't tolerate uh, downtime or it won't be good for your company. And for the same reason, you need everything to be able to evolve while it's serving. You need to be able to change your schemas, change your logic components running in the system, change your data, change the hardware it's running on, everything without ever being down, right? And since this is just the serving part of dealing with big data problems, you need to integrate with other parts of the stack like machine learning systems, offline processing systems, and so on. So how can we solve this problem? We can use Vespa, which is an um, open source platform, open source on Vespa.ai, that uh, delivers the features I just mentioned uh, for you. Um, Vespa was actually started a long, long time ago. Uh, and the problem we were attacking back in those days were web search. This was before Google, so there was uh, lots of different web search engines. right? Um, so search, and in particular web search, is a prototypical big data serving uh, use case, right? Because there are um, close to an infinite number of po potential user queries. You can't compute the answer to every query that you'll see up front, obviously. And because relevance is really important, you need to be able to compute machine learn models over the uh, documents that you're matching. So you have that part of the problem as well. Um, and you need low latency because users really care about latency once you get uh, past about 400 milliseconds end to end. Right? And luckily, there at some point starting at the turn of the century, there was a lot of money flowing into web search, which means we could use lots of resources to solve these difficult problems, which is why the big data serving systems grow, grew out of web search. Right? So um, we worked on these problems um, in Yahoo Search, and we made two systems at the same time, more or less the same time, um, to solve these problems. And they both had the same basic idea that rather than looking up data and sending it somewhere uh, for computation, which is what you typically do in, um, in two-tier systems that uh, needs to work on data, right? You create a representation of the computation that you want to make, and you ship the computation to the data, right? So we created Hadoop to do exactly that on the offline side, and Vespa to do it on the online side, right? Um, Hadoop was open source from the beginning, while Vespa we were unable to, support, uh, to open source because of the complex uh, IP rights around search. Uh, but finally, about one and a half year ago, we were able to open source it. Uh, 
Um, so the company I know best, which uses Vespa, is my own company, uh, which used to be Yahoo and is now called Verizon Media. So we have a cloud system, uh, a cloud service running Vespa for all the use cases in uh, this company. So it's a couple of hundred uh, applications running Vespa. We all run them from my team in seven data centers uh, around the world. In total, we serve over a billion users and about 250,000 queries per second. Uh, and one of the use cases here is the third largest ad networks in the world. Uh, nobody likes ads, but they are what makes it possible for poor people to use all the services on the internet for free. So they have some upside as well. Uh, so one example use case, actually, you can see two here on this page. This, I talked about movie recommendation, and this is another case of recommendation. If a user visits, visits one of the Yahoo uh, pages, uh, he or she gets uh, a list of videos and articles. And those videos and articles are computed on the fly by Vespa based on the personalized profile of that user. And you can also see what's typically called a native ad in there, which is a different application of Vespa that um, do kind of the same thing, but uh, additional stuff for doing a real-time auction and so on, which is also interesting. So, so far I've been talking about two use cases of so a big data serving platform. One is search, where the query is typically uh, some keywords, and the model, machine learning model you want to evaluate is what computes the relevance. And the items, the data you actually want to return, are the ones that have the highest relevance score uh, according to your machine learning relevance model. Right? And then you have the recommendation use case, where the query is typically just some filters specifying what kind of data is eligible for uh, that particular user or market or whatever. And then part of query is also some typically machine learned representation of the user, like a vector or, te or tensor embedding. And your machine learned model is your recommendation model, obviously. And again, you just want to return items that have the highest score. It's actually typically a bit more complicated because you have diversity that you want to factor in and things like that. So those are the two obvious use cases that are uh, keeping us uh, busy at the moment. But it's my belief that there are lots and lots of other use cases for this kind of thing, where you can compute machine learning models over lots of data items with a latency budget of less than 100 milliseconds. Uh, and now that we have a platform that can solve these kind of problems, we can probably apply it to a lot more use cases. So I just want to mention one example, which is not entirely made up, just ob obfuscated a bit. Say you have data items which are some kind of assets, for example, stocks. And you have a machine learning model that can predict uh, the price of these assets based on uh, a lot of data about each of the assets and about other data about other things happening in the world. Now, you can create a query that supplies some of the values for uh, this predictive model, namely the stuff that's happening in the world. And then you can evaluate that machine learning model for each of your stocks, and then find a new price where, given your query, which is sort of an update to what's happening in the world, right? And then you can select the items that have the biggest difference in price predicted from uh, your old world state and the new world state that you send in the query. And then as a result, you are able to, quicker than anybody else, compute what's going to happen across all, your, all the assets that you're interested in, the stocks, if some event uh, is happening. And you can take your event stream with things that are actually happening and find the biggest price mover, the, the stocks that will move the most in response to these events, and do that faster than anybody else, and that's actually very valuable. So this is just an example that you can 
if you abstract a problem like this, you can probably come up with lots of examples of uh, how to use an engine like this. Um, so one question I often get about Vespa is uh, about um, is big data serving and Vespa for analytics? Uh, and to me, analytics is uh, different problems. It does definitely overlap, and you can more or less, if you have something that's created for one, you can usually make it work for the other because of the overlap. But since the design points are different, it will be harder to do one thing or the other, and in particular, harder to uh, make it performant. Right? So in analytics, uh, you typically have response times in low seconds because your users are employees, and they can tolerate waiting a bit. Right? While with big data serving, because you are dealing with end users typically, your latency budget is less than 100 milliseconds. For the same reason, you have lower query rate with analytics. Uh, usually, you are dealing with time series data, which means you can use special optimizations that we assume we cannot uh, do, at least in Vespa, because we support random writes to all the data. Uh, and high availability is much more important in big data serving, as I mentioned. So all of those are things that are better in something like Vespa. But uh, the flip side is that since we can't do a lot of optimizations that you can do with analytics, uh, it gets more expensive once you get to the trillions of documents. OK, so that was a brief introduction to uh, the problem of big data serving. Now I'll move to talking a bit about uh, how Vespa solves this problem. Um, so a bit more detail on the features that Vespa provides. It provides text search and structured uh, data selection uh, at the same time, in a, uh, represented in a query. It supports evaluating machine learning models, scoring, relevance, inference, things like that, using natural language features, advanced machine learning models, uh, integration with TensorFlow, and so on. Um, you can Query time, organize and aggregate uh, data across all the data that is uh, selected in your query without actually sending all the data to one place and doing the aggregation uh, and organization. And you can do all of this while you sustain a high real-time write rate. So typically, you can do from a few thousand to a few tens of thousands of writes per second per node sustained. Uh, the clusters are elastic and auto-recovering, so if you lose a node, the data will automatically rebalance, and if you add or remove hardware, the data will automatically rebalance in the same way. Um, as part of the architecture, it's also a stateless Java uh, container that people use to plug in their own um, data and query and result processing logic. And because these systems can be large, you end up with lots of clusters, lots of nodes and processes, and so on. And setting up all of that manually is just way too hard. So the clusters are managed, and what end users are seeing is a more abstracted representation of uh, the system uh, you want to run. So architecture on the highest level, Vespa is a two-tier system, as I mentioned. There's a stateless Java container tier on top, where you can plug in your own um, logic and where Vespa also runs the stateless part of the logic of executing queries, handling incoming data, and so on. And then we have what we call uh, content nodes and content clusters, which are all implemented in C++, because uh, we don't really like the limitations and problems of working with lots and lots of data in a single process in uh, Java. So this part is all in C++. And this is the part where we actually stores the data, manages redistribution, executes the distributed part or queries, and so on. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned, we have an administration and configuration subsystem, which is another cluster over Zookeeper that uh, manages the other clusters for you. And what the users are seeing is what we call an application package, which is a high-level description of the system that you want to run the clusters, what features should they have, and so on, as well as your Java components, machine learn models, um, 
all of that. So all that is what we call an application package, which is deployed to Vespa, to the administration and configuration uh, system, which will then set up the system for you. If you change your application package and deploy again, the system will change to accommodate uh, the changes you made without taking anything down or anything like that. So the key point, the key purpose of Vespa is to um, achieve low latency uh, computation over data. And there's three strategies we uh, use for that, which is quite uh, obvious. One is parallelization. The queries are scattered to uh, a bunch of content nodes in parallel to execute over shards of the data. On each of the nodes, we dynamically shard over many cores working on separate uh, subspaces of the data while exchanging some information about what subspace to work on next and uh, things like that. Um, secondly, we prepare data structures um, at write time as well as in the background to make uh, read time faster. And the simplest example that you know well of that is uh, reverse indices for text search. Right? But there are also other examples of this, like using a level DB-like structure for the raw data so that you end up with more and more sorted data as it grows uh, older, things like that. And as I mentioned, we move as much of the execution as possible to the data nodes. So for example, if you want to evaluate a machine learning model, that model is part of your application package. When you deploy it, the model is copied to all the uh, content nodes so that we can evaluate the machine learning models locally on all the content nodes in parallel without shipping the data anywhere for computation. Right? And just to drive that point home, here is uh, an example where we uh, compare scalability of um, using TensorFlow serving with Vespa for serving the same model. Um, the partitions here are different uh, content nodes. Once we add more content nodes with Vespa, you get more or less linear uh, scaling. While with TensorFlow, what you need to do is to look up the data in Vespa and then evaluate your TensorFlow model uh, in the stateless tier, which very quickly runs into the bandwidth uh, bottleneck, at which point it doesn't help you at all to add more uh, content partitions. So your data doesn't really, your computation doesn't really scale with the data anymore while with Vespa it does. So a bit more about how Vespa is uh, implemented under hood. We use, in most cases, apart from some specific optimizations, we use what's called document at the time evaluation over all the query operators in your query. And that's because we want to be able to compute uh, nonlinear uh, uh, relevance models. We have Two kinds of fields. We have index fields, which is used for text search, where you have positional text indices for the old data. And we use B trees in memory for the recent changes. Uh, so we, we are not using the old style trick where you have a small uh, reverse index for your changes, and then a lot larger reverse index, and then you merge them. Uh, instead, we use B trees, which are more like databases for the recent changes. And then we flush those to disk in the background and merge. Um, for structured data, we, you typically use what's called attribute fields, which are in-memory forward dense data, uh, where you can also optionally have in-memory B trees uh, over the data if you want to use them as strong criteria in queries. In addition to this, we have a transaction log for persistence and replay if you uh, crash. And we have a separate store in a level DB similar structure for the actual raw data uh, of all the documents that we use for uh, recovery, data redistribution, things like that, but also for uh, returning uh, the payload data of the response. If you have multiple doc schemas, we have one copy of all of this for, um, for each schema. Uh, 
So I mentioned that uh, Vespa distributes data over the content nodes in a content cluster. Um, that happens completely automatically in Vespa. You never ever manually worry about what your shards are, resharding, things like that. That's uh, things nobody using Vespa have worried about for uh, at least 10 years. Um, and there's no way to do offline indexing. The reason we used to do offline indexing back in the old days is because uh, it was CPU costly, while since then, CPU cost has grown much faster than, uh, sorry, CPU performance has grown much faster than bandwidth uh, performance, both wire bandwidth and uh, memory boost bandwidth. So because of that, it's just not a bottleneck anymore. So it's much more uh, efficient to actually do all your indexing locally on the node that will uh, serve the data. So in Vespa, you just list the nodes that goes into a content cluster, and Vespa will distribute the data over those content nodes with a certain replication factor that you can set. If you have a high query rate, you can also do multiple groups inside the content cluster, which each will keep some number of replicas of all the data so that you can uh, do round robin or load balance distribution um, across those groups to scale to higher query, uh, query rates. And optionally, in some use cases, you can also uh, co-locate some data with some property uh, on specific nodes, which is useful for things like personal search, where each of the queries only searches a given user's private data. And in that case, you don't want to scatter all the queries over all the nodes. You want to co-locate the data on some small number of nodes um, and only send a query for a given user to that smaller number of nodes, where the number of nodes is a trade-off between uh, how much scatter gather you need to do and the latency you achieve. Right? And if you change your configuration to add or remove groups or replication factor or whatever, Vespa will redistribute the data in, in the background while you are uh, serving and handling writes, and the same thing will happen if you add nodes or remove nodes or some node die on your things like that. Another big thing in Vespa is the inference engine, which underlies the support for machine learn models uh, and so on. So as part of Vespa, we have a tensor data model. Uh, it used to be somewhat cumbersome to explain tensors to people why we need them and so on, but after TensorFlow came up, it's much uh, simpler. So as you probably know, a tensor is just a multidimensional collection of numbers, at least if you ask a computer scientist. And you can add these tensors to queries, documents, and models, and use them to represent vectors, matrices, higher level, uh, higher dimensional data, and so on. So each Tensor dimension in Vespa can be either indexed, which we use for dense data, or it can be mapped, which we use for sparse data. Right? Uh, and then we have a, a tensor mathematical language that allows you to do to compute uh, mach machine learning models or even handwritten models uh, over these tensors. And that math language contains just six operators, which is pretty cool. And based on those six simple operators, we can uh, combine them to provide all those higher level uh, uh, functions that you have in things like neural nets uh, and so on. So we, have, we provide those higher level functions out of the box as well. So there's a long list in the documentation, which is on the left hand side here, but they are all just implemented in terms of those uh, six uh, core functions in Vespa, which is very nice for us because it makes it simple for us to uh, optimize because we can optimize those core functions and it will work for all the higher level functions, right? Um, so people can handwrite these mathematical expressions to achieve uh, 
whatever computation they want, but uh, in most cases, people find that too difficult. So to solve that problem, we also provide uh, integration out of the box with uh, TensorFlow SAID models. So you can have, you can store your TensorFlow SAID models directly in Vespa, and Vespa will run them for you by converting them to mathematical expressions in this language. And you can do that the same thing with models in Scikit and PyTorch and so on by saving them in the common ONX format, which is also read by uh, Vespa. So just to give some intuition on that, this thing on the left is a simple graph uh, model in TensorFlow. And on the right, you have the equivalent uh, expression in the mathematical uh, language inside Vespa. Uh, just a few words on releases. Uh, we do all development in the open of Vespa on GitHub. So it's on Vespa engine slash uh, Vespa. There's no internal thing we are doing and then syncing or anything like that. It's all uh, in the open. And we create new production releases Monday to Thursday uh, every week. We, for each release, we each release will first have passed our pseudo uh, performance tests and functional tests and so on. But they will also already be running the 150 or so applications in our own uh, Vespa cloud service. So that once the release is uh, in the public, it's already proven on all these applications, so you can safely use it. So I recommend everybody using Vespa to upgrade create a process to upgrade at least once a week using these releases rather than um, ending up being behind. OK, so that was an introduction to Vespa. I'll summarize that and then do just a few more slides, and then we'll be done. Uh, so in summary, if you want to use big data the best way, you need to be able to make decisions in real time uh, over all the data, and Vespa is the engine that's optimized for uh, doing this. You can find it on Vespa.ai, and there you can also find a quick start tutorial that allows you to run it on your laptop or on AVS in less than 10 minutes. We also have a big tutorial that lets you build the blog search and recommendation engine, ending with recommendation using a neural network. Uh, that you can follow, but that takes something like a day, but it starts from just the raw data and builds the whole thing, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I'll stop soon and move to questions, but a few more things about how to use Vespa. We release RPM packages and Docker images. Um, you install the same thing on all your nodes, and then you set one uh, variable that points to the administration uh, subsystem, and the rest is creating your application package, which typically corresponds to something like a Git repo representing your application. Uh, it needs to have three files, one file that list, uh, describes the clusters that you want to run, and one listing the nodes you have available. And then you need schemas for all this, and that the schemas also contains the models you want to run or pointers to the models you want to run because the models are tied to the schema. Right? So this two slides is a complete, simple application package. So we provide HTTP uh, interfaces to do everything towards Vespa. There's also some other alternatives uh, in some cases. Um, yeah, I won't. I'll skip over this. Uh, yeah, maybe I can mention this uh, because there's a lot of search people here I've noticed. So typically, when you do text search, you do supervised learning um, using the structured data, right? Um, while in recommendation, it's more common to use some kind of vector or tensor embedding of both uh, users or whatever, and as well as your documents, and then uh, evaluate over all your uh, data items. And also in 
as much as possible use reinforcement learning because you typically don't have a good idea about what uh, right uh, ranking is. There's a certain movement in search now where you, from, for text search, also mo are moving away from symbolic computation towards uh, vector representations and things like that, which is what people call, some people at least call it, search 2.0. Um, it's interesting, and in practice, the best solution is kind of both at the same time, but in any case, Vespa supports both these uh, kind of use cases, and we have interesting applications doing both approaches, which are pretty good. Um, so one common thing that people are using with text search uh, is what's called gradient-boosted decision trees. That has been sort of the um, benchmark for text relevance uh, for a good while. You can do that in Vespa by writing a mathematical expression ex uh, uh, expressing your forest that comes out from the GBDT training uh, manually. But you can also use XGBoost and just put the model directly in Vespa, and Vespa will understand it and convert it for you. These expressions are really expensive to run, so Vespa contains... Um, we spent a lot of effort into optimizing uh, these expressions to make them fast to run. So Vespa will recognize this shape of mathematical expressions and use very specific optimizations for those. Uh, so that's cool, but then we have papers like this, which uh, says that you can train your GPT model and then uh, train a, a neural net that mimics your model, and that will give you the same results for about 100 uh, of the cost. So some people are doing this uh, as well, and that sort of makes sense when you think about it. So maybe that's what people will do more of in the future. Um, in any case, you can express both these kind of models quite simply in Vespa. Uh, lots of interesting stuff here. You can find these slides online if you really want to, or even if you just want to a little bit, actually. Uh, but I'll stop there and move to questions. We have three minutes if there are any questions. Hands up if you have a question. So I was just wondering, uh, you were showing some of the models from TensorFlow, and they're actually living in the Vespa runtime. So how do you deal there with the amount of memory that that model would actually take up? It seems to be a user-facing. It seems to be running at query time, if I read it correctly. What? Well, I, I didn't understand. So you were taking uh, some deep models, and you were putting them in the, the ranker. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, how does that perform? Because generally, whenever I do this, like a model is maybe four gigabytes. Um, so how does Vespa deal with this? Oh, I see. Yeah, you need to, your, your models, or more specifically, the tensors that are part of the model needs to fit in memory on all the nodes. Otherwise, it's possible to run it, but it will just be way too slow. But typically, models aren't larger than what you mentioned, a couple of gigabytes, and that's uh, fine, really. So the bottleneck really, for at least for simple models, the bottleneck become uh, memory bandwidth, actually, when you evaluate this, right? which is what you want, because it's the scarce resource. Yeah. OK. I guess everything was sparkling oh, clear. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned reinforcement learning in recommendations algorithm uh, yeah. module. Is it, uh, does it contain some sort of explore exploit techniques for recommendations? Like, yeah, uh, explore exploit. Uh, so when you do uh, reinforcement learning, you want to, uh, if you're not familiar with it, you want to, you have some model and you want to exploit that model to uh, return results, but you also want to, for some of your traffic, explore other options so that you can learn a better model, right? So that's what explore exploit is. And in that case, the question is, does Vespa support this out of the box? No, we do not. Uh, we have, you can plug in functionality like that uh, pretty easily. And uh, I actually wrote a blog post you can find on Medium, which goes through details of how one use case that is running in production to do comment ranking using uh, reinforcement learning is doing this. So 
if you're interested in technical details, you can look at that. Yeah. Any more? Okay. In that case, could you all put your hands together and thank John for a really interesting talk.